Hey there, Columbia Grove, it's Pastor Nick. Hey, if you're brand new, we just wanna take the time to say welcome to the family. We are praying and hoping that this is a place that you're going to feel welcome and loved, whether that's on the online community or whether you are actually meeting here on Sunday in the church building. If you're brand new, we'd like you to go to columbiagrove.org, click I'm new and fill out the information below. This will allow us to be in communication with you and send you information about what is coming up, such as, do you know how to reserve your spot if you'd like to meet on Sunday in the church? That'll be in that information. We have a youth group is gonna be starting in the next handful of weeks and there's just certain things parents need to know. So please fill that out. Once you've completed it, we will also trigger a $5 donation to the charity of your choice. Now, of course, if you're not new, you've been here before, you're probably watching this on Facebook, you probably know the routine, but I'm telling you right now, do it right now, go to check in, click Columbia Grove, and that will trigger a donation to the charity of the month. A lot of the times these charities consist of uh, giving children shoes or paying for schools or buildings or, or education, whatever uh, the charity of the month is. It changes every single time. So you get to be a part of that and we all can help just by simply clicking some buttons. Guys, I love you and I can't wait to see whether that's online or in the church building. Please be safe during this COVID season. Hi, Columbia Grove. I'm Kathy Adelman, a board member at Real Options Pregnancy Center in Wenatchee, where we serve women looking for STI testing, pregnancy testing, and ultrasound testing. Many of the women we serve are in crisis due to an unplanned or unwanted pregnancy. We also provide parenting support to families. There is no charge for any of our services because of the support of local churches and individuals who understand the importance of this ministry to our valley. Columbia Grove has historically been a strong supporter of Real Options through our baby bottle campaign, which we're doing virtually this year. We need your help as this is one of our primary sources of income. Here's a challenge for you. We have a donor who will match your donations up to $1,000. Go to Columbia Grove's website and look for the virtual baby bottle tab to make your donation today. Thank you in advance for your generosity. Good morning, Columbia Grove Covenant Church. This is Brant Capel from the leadership team with an update. We met uh, just this last Sunday. Wanted to bring a couple of things to you. The first thing is that we have extended Pastor Paul's um, interim position. Uh, he was on a six month contract. We've extended that for another six months with plans to initiate uh, the proceedings to make his hire permanent. We're excited about it. Paul's excited about it. We have been so thankful um, for the work that he has done in our church, and we look forward to, uh, in the near future, bringing a call of uh, to the congregation of a permanent position to Pastor Paul for an executive pastor role. Congratulate him if you uh, if you know his number, see him, um, send a thanks right now via via the messaging. We're so thankful for him, and frankly, we're thankful for all the staff and our pastors. Um, we just are, are grateful for everything they're doing in these uh, interesting times. We want to thank everyone for the success in helping with our yard sale last month. We raised a great amount of money for denting the debt of our mortgage. And if you have more stuff you need to get rid of, we're going to do it again here in the near future. So be on the lookout for another opportunity for that great way for us to clean out some stuff in our homes and for folks to buy it and for it to go to a good cause of knocking down that mortgage debt so thank you so much for that uh second or third we were brought an opportunity from the kenyan fellowship church pastor john alfred um, actually travels over here on sundays from the west side of the mountains to preach to some folks over here from that denomination they were looking for a building space um, and uh, for a weekly basis, a church service. 
we vetted their um, their teachings, their philosophy, um, agreed that it would be a good fit, and have gone ahead and um, authorized a um, weekly contract for that rental. So great to be able to use our space to continue to spread the word of Jesus to folks that um, are needing that. Last but not least, um, we are next month as a team meeting for a socially distanced leadership team retreat on Friday and the Saturday. Uh, please be praying for us uh, for that time, praying for the staff for that time. Um, we make some pretty big decisions for the year going forward as far as visioning and we are uh, looking forward to doing that, looking forward to planning out what uh, we can do going forward to continue to be able to provide the message of, of Christ, the word of Christ to you. And if you have any suggestions, any ideas, any concerns, please bring them to us. We are your voice in the church as your elected body. So we are just looking for your prayer and for your thoughts during that time. Thank you so much, everyone. Please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us on the leadership team. Have a blessed morning. Good Sunday morning, Columbia Grove family. We are so glad you're here worshiping with us today. Just thank you for all those people who keep on doing all the just little chores and jobs around the church. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your continued uh, donations financially for the church to keep the church operating and going during this crazy pandemic time. Uh, we also have a food bank here at the church, as you know. Uh, if you would like to do any food bank donations, uh, non-perishable items, please bring those into the church office as well, uh, Monday through Thursday. When something happens good, you do it again. So, we had such a successful church yard sale here a few weeks back, and some more items have been donated, and you can keep on donating items that in later September, we will have another church yard sale. We were able to generate about $900. That went to our church mortgage and a couple of boxes of clothes for the uh, went up to Shaktulik, Alaska to help them out as well. We do need volunteers for that. If you have time during the week to come in and sort things out, and also the day of, which we don't have a firm date yet, but as soon as we do, you'll know, just to help out for even two-hour increments at the yard sale itself. So thank you. God bless. Love like Jesus. There's a hungry woman seeking bread, a homeless man who needs a bed. Let love be heard, louder than words. There's a struggling marriage near the end, a lonely child who lacks a friend. Let We want to shine. We want to show. We want to be the ones willing to go. We want to be your hands and feet. Find you in 
find you in the least of these. Let love be heard louder than words. May your church be known today for all the grace you give away. Let love be heard louder than Well, good morning and welcome to worship. Those who are in the building, those who are online, joining us online. And thank you so much for leaving those uh, comments today. It's just great to see people from all over the place. I see uh, folks from Alaska. Uh, it's good to see you, James Barefoot. Um, just good to see Bev Seals, Rebecca Knopf, Vicki Miller, uh, Brian Adelman. So from house churches to people worshiping in their, in their living rooms, we are one church. Uh, we are, have always been a church that has been all about three main things. Worship. We want to worship Jesus and help people to get into a, into a relationship with Christ. Connection. Building connection with other Christians so we can grow in our faith and in our friendships. And service. And you know what? Even a pandemic can't stop that. Amen. Now, we do it in different ways, but, but, but uh, Jesus said the gates of hell cannot stop his church. So, you know, some tiny little dinky little virus isn't going to do anything like that. So thank you for being part of worship. Thank you for making time to worship this morning. Um, we're, we're having a couple problems with our social stuff, so I'm not, we're not going to be able to put any things up on the screen. But um, it is just so fun to see people from all over the place um, participating in worship together. Uh, just as a way of remembering how we are one church, I, if you're at home, I want to give you just a little, a little quick glimpse of what things do look like in the building uh, right now. So, so here we go. You, so, on, in person church, will you wave? Let's let's put that. Let's put. Uh, uh, is that up on the screen yet? Let's let's get that up on the screen. Maybe not. There we go. Wave. Yay. Okay. Socially distanced. Isn't that fun? Okay. Sort of not. Yeah, there we go. That's jelly beans. That's what jelly beans look like. And apple pie right there. Okay. Yeah, something like that. But we are one church, one church worshiping together, and we're just grateful that we can all be a part of it. Thank you for your generous support. Thank you for, for investing your time and your talents. We want to be uh, journeying with you in whatever God is doing in your life. So we have a prayer team. Um, so if you are at home, there's a number of phone numbers that you could call and uh, folks that would love to uh, pray with you right now. Um, include, and so you can see those things in the, uh, in the notes next to the video, or even to uh, just leave a comment or private message. Um, we're in this together, and uh, folks, we can, we, can, we can love one another through this. So we're going to open up in a word of prayer, and so I invite you to pray with me, and then we're going to just turn it over into worship and just remember God's goodness. God, we thank you that we get to gather together as a church family this morning. God, thank you that absolutely nothing can stop your church. And thank you for the technology that allows your church to gather in new ways. So whether we're in the building, whether we're at home, whether we're with a house church, for those who are uh, joining us from other parts of the country or even outside of the country, Lord, thank you that, that you knit us together as one. Lord, uh, minister to us by your Holy Spirit. Fill us through your word. Challenge us and send us, we pray. And we thank you for the opportunity to do all those things. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to lead in a, in a song. Um, they're letting me actually do something with music today, which is super cool. I love doing this. But as the song is, uh, is, is going, I'd like you to, to fill in the blank here. Um, God, I see your goodness in. And we're going to give an opportunity in the room for people to shout out some answers and um, comment online. We're going to read off some of those comments in just a few moments. 
I see your goodness in. God, I see your goodness in. So however you've experienced God's goodness this week, that might have been through family, that might have been through, through creation, that might have been through a friendship, that might have been through a great meal. However you saw God's goodness this week, let's testify to that together as we worship. If you're in the room, we invite you to stand. You're going to want to stand for this song. And if you're at home, feel free to stand too. Absolutely. <laughs> Living room dancing is completely appropriate. <laughs> Absolutely. Joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before you, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of eternal gladness, fill us with the from the room. If your goodness in, and friends, and family, I'm hearing that. Your goodness in. Beauty of the valley. And God, we thank you for the good, your goodness is, is seen in, in forgiveness of sin, says Bev. 
for Cheryl. Cheryl, it's good to see you. Glad to have you with us. And the beauty of nature. Brian says, I see God's goodness in the heart of his servants as light during this time of darkness. Evelyn says, I see God's goodness through my family. Debbie says, I see God's goodness through friends, family, nature, and the church. Mary Ann Halverson says, I see God's goodness through my husband. Gene, you just had a good day, man. That's good, man. Okay, Aylette Ness says, I see God's goodness through my family and friends. Chuck Mosier says, I see God's goodness through the beautiful area we live in. Julia Scott says, I see God's goodness in my husband, Greg. God, we thank you for all the ways we experience your goodness. You are so good to us. And whether in the moment this morning it feels like this is a... Uh, a time of celebration or a time of hardship. God, in all cases and in all ways, you are present, you are here, and you, God, are good. And so we trust you, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And I invite us to stay in that same tone of prayer, and if you're in the room, you can have a seat, but it's the same tone of prayer as Courtney Richardson um, joined us on video to lead us in prayer. Courtney, thank you so much for leading us in prayer this morning. Hi, Columbia Grove. It's nice to be here today to be able to do the congregational prayer with, for you. Let us join together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I thank your holy name for what you've done for us and that you've provided us with so much and that you provided us with the opportunity because of your death to be able to come and sit at the feet of the Father and to find peace during these really t tough, tumultuous times. I just thank you that you provided us with the Holy Spirit, Father, that we can look to him to guide us and direct us and to help us to make good choices, choices that will honor you, Father, and that will help others to see your light in our lives. I thank you, Father, that as this election gets closer at hand, that you give us as Christians not only the wisdom to know how to vote and the desire and the strength to actually get up and, and vote, but that we will corporately vote in such a way that it shows this nation that we want you, Father, back in our lives, back in our laws, back in our schools, and back in our communities. Let us as a Christians stand up and be heard that we want God to rule and not man. We thank you, Lord, that you are bringing connection to each one of us, even in the midst of this COVID-19, that you're bringing healing to families and that you're helping us to find support and direction in these times. We thank you that even though we are not allowed to see each other, or be, I mean, be close to each other or attend church, that we are still able to communicate and to find connection of some sort. We thank you, Lord, that you're anointing the pastors in all churches, in all areas, and the associate pastors and the leaders, that, Father, you give them the words and the direction to be able to minister in these really tough times. That if it was tough before to minister, it is really tough now. And they need an extra special anointing to be upon each one of them to be able to help the hurting out there. We thank you, Lord, that you're with our children and our the families of those children that are having to navigate the new school system and what that looks like. I just ask that you bring people together to help one another and to help these youth um, 
be able to learn and grow and be safe. And that, Lord, I thank you that you're going to be with Gayla as she brings the sermon to us and that you'll help her to present to us a nugget of truth that we can walk away with and think about this week to help guide us in the direction that you have for each of us. And Father, I thank you that you are in the midst of all the needs that this church has, uh, financial needs, emotional, medical, spiritual, and that you're just help us to find you and your peace and your healing and your direction in all these situations that our church body is being faced with. And I just praise you, Father, and I just thank you for your mighty love for us and for this beautiful day. Help us to rejoice and know that you are in the midst of everything, whether it's good or bad, that you are there with us and you are in the midst of it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thanks, Courtney, for that prayer. Just love hearing your heart. And just want to invite Gayla, Pastor Gayla, to, to come up. We are in a series in 1 Peter that's called Facing Outward, where um, we might be in a pandemic, but that doesn't mean that we can't reach out. And so there's a theme throughout this series, and it's this, is that, is that crisis turns us inward. Can we put that up on the screen? But God turns us outward. So we challenge one another to let Jesus put margin in your life so that you have something to give to others. And so we've been talking about some of the different ways that we can be reaching out, you know, for our need to turn to Jesus, our need to be ministering to our families, our need to be ministering to our communities. And today I asked Gayla, both because I wanted you to hear her voice and her perspective on these things, but because Gayla has a special focus in our church on seniors and on children. And so today, we're going to be looking at what it means to be reaching out to our children, to our grandchildren. Some of you out there, you got great-grandchildren, and you can make a difference in their lives. So I'm just, just blessed to have Gayla sharing today. So I'm just going to lift up a short prayer for you, and then I'm going to get out of the way, and you let them have it, okay? All right. Well, Lord, just, just pray for Gayla. God, give her boldness today. Let uh, her words be your words. And Lord, help our hearts to be open to receiving what you have to uh, speak to us through her today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Online, give him a, give him a hand clap in the, in the building. Give her a hand clap. All right. We'll see you in, see you in a bit. <laughs> Good morning. Glad to see you all this morning. Um, I'm in seminary at the moment, and we have been studying uh, family ministry. So uh, it's been quite difficult to do all the things that we're required to do when we can't get to our children, you know, and to our kids, the families, because of COVID. But today I want to talk about discipleship in the home. Now, I know many of you have had kids. Some of you have toddlers. Um, how many of you knew what your children were going to be when they were really small? You could see it. I had um, my, my oldest, he was a warrior in the womb. I, I knew this kid was going to be a warrior. I mean, we called him little Thor. We had to put him on a leash because he could run, you know. <laughs> he, really, he, he um, went to state in um, cross country and track, and he became a cavalry scout in the 10th Mountain Division, did two tours in Afghanistan. But we guided him because we knew we could see that in him. Now my second son, at 18 months, he found a screwdriver and he climbed up on the counter and he dismantled my food processor. <laughs> so we put it back together and he used that as a pull toy. He was an electrician from a very young age. When he was seven, his grandma gave him a toaster, a dial, a dial telephone, and a screwdriver and said, happy birthday, you can take them apart. He was like, oh, can I? You know, he was so excited. <laughs> so we knew he was going to be an electrician. When he went into the army, he was a Bradley mechanic, but his job was electrical systems. 
and he went to school to be an electrician, and now he works for Boeing. And he got to um, wire the first um, 737 MAX. So our children are, need to be guided from the very earliest ages, because what I have learned in my work is that the, the way we guide them now, when they're old, in their 80s and 90s, they will still be going that direction. And we can give our children purpose. And that gives our lives purpose. And that our older people in our church are needed, desperately needed, to help our children find direction. So our passage this morning is coming out of Exodus chapter 2. We're going to be looking at Moses when he was a baby. It's chapter 2, verse 1. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in, a, in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, she said. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take the baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. The word of the Lord. You see, in, in Egypt at this time, a new dynasty had come. They didn't know the stories of Joseph and Abraham and Isaac. They didn't know about these people. And they just saw them as a threat. And so they tried to get rid of them. They put the, the families and the people into bondage, making bricks all day, the slaves. They killed the babies. They threw them in the Nile. You know, that was population control. They wanted to get rid of these people because they thought they were going to take over. You know, power is an ugly thing when it's used for the wrong purposes. But the families were trying to save their babies. They were hiding them. You know, Moses was put in a basket and put in the river. You know, the crocodiles were eating the babies that had been thrown in the river. It was a dangerous place for him. You know, the, the midwives were letting the babies live and lying about it to Pharaoh. You know, his sister watched over him. So Miriam was probably six, seven, eight, nine years old. You know, Aaron was three. So this mother didn't want to lose her baby, you know, because she loved him. And then we read that Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter at about the age of four when he was weaned. And how, can you imagine having to give up your baby? You know, there are a lot of people today who do. But she, this mother saw that her baby had an opportunity that not all the other babies were going to get. And so she let him go. And he went to Pharaoh's home. And he was trained to be a leader of a nation. He was trained to be a warrior. He was trained in economy, how to read and to write. He went to Harvard because at that time, people were sending their princes to Egypt to train them. So this slave kid was getting an education that most kids would never get. And Moses became the most influential person 
on this earth. Governments, civilizations, and religions set up their societies according to the laws that Moses wrote. You know, we live by, you know, some of the things that Moses wrote, some of his laws. You know, Moses said, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. That was one of his laws. Another law was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That was Moses. Don't eat bacon. That was Moses. <laughs> You can blame him. <laughs> Moses became a great leader because his parents saw something in him. Because one woman took him in, adopted him. You know, he had a family that was made up of families. And the saying is true that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. There is power in that statement. And yet, we tell our mothers, you're just a mom. You know, they have the power to raise children, fathers do too, children that will change this world. But today, a family's Family tree is not nice and neat. You know, everybody has their own branch. Our families are under attack. The family tree looks more like a spider web where you have, you know, steps and halves. You have people who are living alone, people in the nursing homes. You have people who are coming together and calling themselves family by choice. You know, the family tree just is more like a tangled vine. And yet, today with COVID, as we are putting people into church, you're coming back, we're putting you back into family groups. And the interesting thing is, some of you aren't family by blood, but you're family by choice. I see some of you out here. And so church, it's time to come home. Come home to your family. We're here and we're waiting for you. So in my family ministry class, we've been talking about the church being a family of families. What does that look like? How do we do church with the, when every, we're focused around family groups? Well, Diane Garland, who wrote Family Ministry, a Comprehensive Guide, says... The family ministry directly or indirectly forms families into congregational communities. It increases the Christ-likeness of family relationships of Christians. Or it equips and supports families for the work which they are called to do. And the last statement surprised me. Do we think of our family groups our families is having a call. We're so individualistic now that we think, I have a call. You know, you have a call. You're called to go there. But as a family, what does a family calling look like? And what are the possibilities? What could we do with that? Our church creates families, it gives families direction, and it helps them flourish. But how do we do that? And where's our direction? So in our, in our Turning Out series, we have been in First Peter. And so I would like to read to you First Peter 1.22, and it says... Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. 
For you have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. You see, love is our compass. Love is God's gift to us. And it comes from within the depths of God himself. We receive it when we respond to the word, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is God's love that is poured into us through Jesus Christ. Peter is saying here that you have responded to the good news of the gospel. Now, I want you to respond with the love that is put in you. It's that love that resides deep within your soul. And it is the power to love one another. It is given to you by God. God gives us the ability to love one another deeply as families, even when we weren't family. And this love is our compass. You see, Jesus is our true north. We follow him. You know, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when we set our compass on him, we will know which way to go. It can't be made true through ritual or Moses' law, but it is made true through Jesus Christ. See, it is God that empowers us to do this work, not ourselves. And that's the beauty. You know, we just have to receive it and then move with it and use it. Discipleship in the home is the work of planting God's love in our children's hearts. It's the work of setting their compass seeing what they're going to be when they're older and helping them find their way, helping them find purpose early. Moses' mother saw something in him, you know, that she was willing to hide him. Pharaoh's daughter saw something in him too. She was willing to, to take him in and train him. And we know that it was God you know, putting that blessing on him. We have a promise in Proverbs 22, 6 that says, start a child off in the way that they should go, and even when they are old, they will not depart from it. I believe that verse with all my heart. I have seen it. There have been times I said, Lord, this child is yours. <laughs> you know, you've got to take care of him because at this moment I can't. You know, you know where he's going. You know, he's going to Afghanistan. He's yours. And God has always, always given a, a sign. Yeah, I'm here. He's mine. I have him. Even in those times when we think you, they don't love God anymore. You know, they've walked away. You know, this says that you train them the way they're going to go, and they will go that way even when they're trained at the age of four. So kids need five or six adults in their lives who can see who they're going to be. They need you older adults to take them fishing. They need you to take them um, and show them your, your hobbies. They need you to stop one day, you know, Walk away from the golf course. You know, take them out for a cup of coffee and talk to them. Help them see who they're going to be. Help them, you know, find their compass. You know, point them to Jesus. I had three women in my life um, that were mentors to me. They weren't family because my family moved here whenever I was a baby, you know, because there were more job opportunities. 
you know, all my family lives in Arkansas and Oklahoma. There's actually a little town down there that it's all family, and it's a big family. Yeah. <laughs> but there was one woman, um, Mrs. Wade, she took me in, she taught me and my sister how to cook, how to sew, she taught us hospitality, and she taught us the joy of loving God. There was another woman, Ada, who was a neighbor. She lived on the other side of the orchard. She taught us the adventure of life and to be creative, you know, and to just love people. There was another woman named Agnes. She was my Sunday school teacher. She taught me about Jesus. She taught me how to love the people around me in my church, that we are family. And she taught me how to make egg salad sandwiches, you know. They saw the person I was going to be, and they nurtured that. And I am eternally grateful for them. But our, our nuclear families, our families in general, are just fragmented. You know, the nuclear family is something new. In the history of the world, people lived in clans, in those big families. You know, mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles and cousins, they lived together. And they were able to absorb the trials of life, you know, like a trampoline, because they were interwoven. You know, when something happened to one, everybody stuck in, stepped in and helped out. We don't have that anymore. You know, in most cases, People move across the country for job opportunities. You know, grandma and grandpa move, you know, where it's warmer. You know, and, and the aunts and uncles move across the world. And we have people now who are all alone. We have people in, in nursing homes whose family never comes to see them. You know, we, we have a problem. It, our families are fragmented, but church, we are the solution. We are the solution. We are a family. We are God's family, and we welcome new people in. And so, as we set our children's compass, we need you teaching them love and compassion, giving them hope, you know, giving them that direction, telling them about Jesus Christ. We need you to become their family, you know, that, that you, they would call you grandma and grandpa, even though you're not. We need you to see who they're going to be, you know, to teach them how to run you know, all these electronics. You know, teach them how to fix a car, how to cook a meal. We need you. And families, you know, mom and dad, you're probably thinking, oh great, there's one more thing I have to do. Now I'm working from home, I'm doing school from home, and I have to do Sunday school at home. You know, I'm sure you're feeling overwhelmed. But I want you to know that God gives you everything you're going to need to, to lead your children, to set their compass. And it's easy stuff to do. You know, teach your children how to pray, how to talk to God. You know, teach them to be still and to listen for him to talk back. Read them Bible stories. You know, and you say, if you say, you know, I don't know anything about the Bible, that's okay. The Bible was written as stories. It was written to be told to each other verbally. And it's written so that when you read it, each story, all these truths and all these lessons can just, just come out of it. You let the Bible tell its own story. Tell your stories of faith. How do we know God is even moving if you're not telling us your story? I know how God moves and I can depend on that because I've heard my mom tell stories of how God moved in her life. You know, Harriet told me how God moved in her life. 
You know, Agnes. Hide God's word in their heart. I know all of you have a favorite memory verse. I challenge you to help a child learn your favorite memory verse. It will become their favorite memory verse. And when they're old, when they've lost their faculties, that verse will still be there. And God will speak to them through that verse. Worship. Crank the radio in the car and worship. I mean, that one's easy. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, we have some wonderful radio stations that, that play Christian music. You know, we are so blessed today to have that. Model compassion, kindness, patience, justice, and mercy. Our children need to see us standing up and saying, you know, what's going on in this world is not right. Our children need to hear us. They need to see us leading. And we can do that as families, as this family of families. Teach our children to serve one another. You know, families are good at serving. Miriam took responsibility for her little brother. You know, she went and got someone to take care of him. And it was mom. I don't know if Pharaoh's daughter, I don't know if she ever knew that. But mom was always watching over him. And she had no Bible. All she had was the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And of Joseph. But she had, you know, an extended family. And so she told him about God. She told him to love God, even though they didn't know his name at that time. And she just planted God, God's love and the knowledge of God deep in his heart at four years old. As we become a family, our new mission field is single families, people who are alone. We are having a mass exodus of people coming into our valley. My husband's in construction. Houses and apartments by the thousands are being built here in Wenatchee. These people are coming. They have no family connection. We have the opportunity to reach out to them and give them family. And one of the, 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 I think the greatest place at the moment, one thing you can do for your children is to sit around a table with them. Studies have said that if that was the one thing you did with your family, your kids would be okay. Because sitting around a table and eating together builds relationships. It strengthens their bodies. It provides stability. And it gives them attachments. Our kids don't need more soccer. They need nutritious food. And if any of you, if any of you've had a house full of boys, you know <laughs> that eating is a sport. You know, <laughs> they will keep you busy. But if you're alone, you know, connect. Let us know. We will connect you with someone. You know, you can go and eat with them. Help them cook a meal. Moses became. A great leader. Eventually, he came home. He came back to lead his people out of slavery. And the night they left Egypt, they had a meal together. And they called it Passover. And they reverently celebrated their deliverance. 
as a family. And we still celebrate this meal today. I mean, look at this, thousands of years. What a family we are part of. We call it communion. And we, we celebrate it in memory of Jesus and what he has done for us. That he is our true north. That God does love us and he gives us a compass. And Jesus has died for us and he gave the sacrifice for us so that we might live free. Church, this is our family meal, communion. And I'm going to say, church, it is time to come home and eat with us. And so I invite you all to come and I invite you to participate in communion with us. Thanks, Kayla. Can we give her a hand? Online, give her a hand. And let's, uh, let's, let's close in prayer as we, as we um, prepare to serve one another in communion. Lord, we thank you that, um, that you have created us to be a family with one another. And God, you have also invited us into your family. And so even right now, Lord, we want to pray for anybody that feels distant from you. Whether that's because they're physically isolated from others, and I think of those who might be joining us uh, online right now, or even those who uh, may be in the room, but, but there's, I mean, there, 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 there are ways we just feel isolated and distant, but thank you that we are never so distant from you that we can't come to you. How through Jesus and his death and resurrection, you invite us into your family and invite us to be family with you one another. So Lord, move in our midst, we pray. Feed us through your spirit and through your word. Feed us as we, as we, as we remember what it means to be Christian community together. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to invite you to uh, take out your communion elements. So if you're at home, um, hopefully you've got some communion elements, really any form of bread, any form of juice. If you're here in the building, we have these kind of individual self-serve things um, that you don't need to really love, but, uh, but God can, can work through them. And I invite us to, uh, to take out those elements. Take out the, the bread or the a cracker or whatever you have that represents bread. Because friends, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. And so as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Lord, we thank you for these tangible reminders of your love, that you gave your body, that you shed your blood, that we belong to you. Lord, would you strengthen us through this, this time of remembering you and this time of serving one another. Remind us of the family that we are. Open our hearts to the family that is yet to be for those who are needing places to connect and people to connect with. And God, we thank you that it is by your body and through your blood that we are family like this. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so I invite you to serve one another here in the room. Serve one another at home. Let's remember God's goodness. Serve one another with the words you see on the screen. Christ's body given for you. Christ's blood shed for you. Let's worship him together. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare for our living hope. Your presence, Lord. Jesus. 
I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is Truly, God is present as we remember him, as we serve one another, as we are family to one another, a family of families. I'd like to invite us to uh, pray these words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And I uh, invite you to pray them out loud. So in the room, pray them out loud, loud and proud. If you're at home, pray them out loud, loud and proud. If you're on your own, Pray them out loud, loud and proud. You're in an RV somewhere. Pray them out loud, loud and proud. You're in a tent. You're in your car. Pray them out loud. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. Um, in just a moment, we're going to put some um, questions up on the screen. And I would urge you to spend a few moments um, with the, the, the people that you are worshiping with. Just spend a few moments around those questions. These are just questions about what it means to be family, what it means to set a compass. Um, we can be church to one another. We can be family to one another. And... Um, so let's, we'll, let's close in prayer, and then I'll dismiss us to, uh, to those questions. And uh, again, just thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for making the time online. Thanks for making the time here in the building. Thanks for, thanks for taking the time to worship today. God, we thank you for opportunities like this to gather in your name, to be reminded and strengthened through your word, to have opportunities to serve one another around the sacrament of Holy Communion, to be fed by you to be strengthened by you, and now to be sent by you. So send us from this place, this virtual place, this physical space as well. Send us from this place to a world that desperately needs to see the love of Jesus, that desperately is looking for the kind of lasting, meaningful family that our heart longs for. Lord, help us to minister well to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Help us to leave a legacy of faith, to set the compass of our hearts and their hearts in the direction of Jesus. And we'll give you all the praise. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, friends, go in peace and serve the Lord. Love like Jesus. Amen.